Hello, everybody. My name is Brent Kelly. I am the President and Principal Analyst at Calcorn Incorporated. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you today where we are going to be talking about how AI is transforming communications. This will be a panel session today, and it is my pleasure to have three very distinguished guests from our industry. First, I will uh, do an introduction of them, and then I'll allow them to take just a minute and explain what they are doing in this area of AI within their respective organizations. So our first panelist is Keith Griffin. He is the CTO of Intelligence and Analytics at the Cisco Collaboration Group. Our second panelist is Jonathan Rosenberg, and he is the Chief Technology Officer at Five9. And our third panelist is Ilya Buchstein, and he is the general manager for Microsoft Teams devices. So uh, if I could invite each of you, maybe Keith, if we could just start with you and then, and then rotate, take just a minute and explain what you and your company are doing with respect to AI. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Brent, and thanks for having me uh, today. Uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty heavily invested at this point in uh, the AI and machine learning space and have been over the last uh, number of years. And we're, we're focused really on a number of different uh, areas, uh, right? We've got to solve, uh, and what we've been solving for specifically in the last year is empowering remote workers, as well as right now looking at that pivot towards um, uh, return to a hybrid workplace. And the scope for AI and machine learning across all of those areas is, is huge and has been huge. And that applies across, uh, you know, uh, knowledge workers, contact center, and the entire, uh, entire space. So uh, you can imagine the AI workload uh, from you know computer vision to speech technologies uh, to even the analytics on on the platform often overlooked in the AI space but still you know critically important so yeah there's a there's just a huge range of areas that we've been focusing on um, in in uh, WebEx and across the entire collaboration portfolio at Cisco I'm sure we'll get into all of the details later outstanding thanks Jonathan sure so uh, contact center and AI these days go pretty much hand in hand in fact my my official job title is, is CTO and head of AI, so uh, we're doing quite a bit in that space. Um, you know, the two I'd call out uh, are, are uh, agent assists. So we've been launching capabilities that help agents do their job better, as well as a virtual a virtual agent that helps uh, deal with the customer requests uh, for self service and getting them connected to the right agent quickly. But as a whole, Connect Center is really the tip of the spear for artificial intelligence and collaboration. Um, and uh, almost every aspect of the technology is touched by it. Speech analytics is a big deal is another one, and uh, WFO and WFM are some of the adjacencies in this market that are being touched by it. For us at Five9, our big focus is on trying to help companies um, do two things at the same time, reduce labor costs and improve customer experience, both simultaneously. That's our focus. Outstanding. Thanks, Jonathan. Ilya, tell us about you and what you're doing at Microsoft. Sure. Thanks, Brent. And uh, much like Keith, I want to start off by saying thanks for having me. Uh, before the pandemic, I think I had a really nice streak going of attending EC in person for, uh, I think, at least six years uh, without a, a gap. So I certainly miss it, and I appreciate this opportunity to participate at least virtually. You miss uh, the alligators, right? I mean, what's, what's I, the I know, I know. <laughs> Seriously, on the biodome in, in Florida. Um, so uh, with Microsoft Teams, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, we are uh, one of, if not the leading uh, platform that people are using today to change how they work. It was a uh, great growing change before the pandemic, a massively accelerated force change during the pandemic. And what we're hearing from customers is that it's going to be a durable change to hybrid work after pandemic. So as the tool that uh, so many uh, people, hundreds of millions, uh, use for collaboration and communications, we're constantly looking to see what we can do to improve how people work, to make it seamless, less friction, easier, more productive. And AI is, as Jonathan Keith said, a, a key part of that in every aspect, whether it's uh, helping take action items, uh, taking notes, really we see it throughout the product. Personally, my team is driving a set of efforts around AI and audio and video in meetings so that we can create better 
uh, and frankly, more equal experiences between people in rooms and people remote at home. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, all right. So uh, let's just kind of get this uh, first question going. And, and that question would be, from your vantage point, where do you see AI having the most impact on the communications and collaboration market? And any of you can respond. I can okay. jump in since there was yeah, silence. Go, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, I'll just build on, on what I said a minute ago in my intro. Uh, we think this new way of working, this hybrid work where uh, every collaboration, every interaction, every meeting has some folks remote, some folks in person. What we hear is near universal consensus from customers that this is durable. This is the way we're all going to work. Um, and so we see a lot of work needed to make that experience better less exhausting, more productive. And we think AI and machine learning is key to, to helping that. So that is everything from adding a lot more uh, richness around ongoing collaboration so that people don't feel like they have to attend as many meetings. Things like being able to look and see when was my name mentioned and what are the items that I need to pay attention to. Um, to making the actual meeting experience richer. So as I said a minute ago, you know, before the pandemic, if there was a meeting that was important, people would attend in person and the remote attendees would often be sort of forgotten. Right. Now everyone is remote. We're all equal. We all have our little square uh, of video, if you will. But when folks start going back to offices, I think we'll actually see the opposite. We'll see people in rooms with that sort of God view of video, your two people at the end of the table we'll see them be disadvantaged unless we can bring AI to bear and sort of use intelligent audio, intelligent video to uh, show every person in the room as if they were remote, to create digital whiteboards where everyone can collaborate, um, just to create more inclusive experiences. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize that by saying you're really focusing at least on the hybrid meeting experience. Jonathan, what do you see? Yeah, so um, I think that's important. I'm going to be a little contentious on purpose, too. Um, I, I actually, I would argue, like, I agree with the hypothesis that hybrid is going to be a huge focus of attention in the coming years for the cloud market and making the in-person and remote attendees both feel equally contributor. I actually think that's going to be more about devices uh, and new hardware in rooms um, and other things than AI by itself. Um, but but putting that aside is a little like throwaway for you to argue with me on. <laughs> um, the Connex Center is to me uh, more fascinating. And, and part of the reason I took this job, I mean, my prior role was a CTO at Cisco Collab and worked on uh, WebEx uh, and, and many related things. I, and I came to Connex Center because Connex Center is an area where AI has immediate business value. Instead of it being like, oh, that's cool. Someone, you know, some AI listened to my meeting and, you know, took an action on it for me. That's great. Are, are you going to change your purchase decision? Are you going to move your meeting product from one vendor to another vendor because of that? I would say probably not. I think they're part of the continuous improvement in feature set. On the other hand, with the Connex Center, if you can demonstrate that an AI product can save you know, 20 seconds out of every call for an agent or allow customers to get self-service and therefore not need to connect to an agent, um, these things like have demonstrable ROI, like literally to the minute of time. And that allows you to make the business case for purchasing, turning on, and sometimes stumbling your way through these products, many of which are in their infancy. Um, and sort of that's why I feel like Connex Center is the place it's going to happen first. And it'll really put that technology to the test and scale up there. Uh, and then we'll see it more widely adopted in areas like meetings and, and UC, which I think will be the last one to take this stuff, actually, um, uh, later on. That's my... Hope someone disagrees with me for some fun on the panel. Okay, right. I only disagree center. with that last part uh, <laughs> about UC being last. As someone who calls contact centers a lot, Jonathan, Godspeed, man. Like I would love to save <laughs> yeah. minutes on every call and get better service. Uh, I just also want to have better meetings too. Yeah, good. 
Well, yeah. so Keith, me, you, me, you have me, a comment me, too, I'm sure. Yeah, well, exactly. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. There, there's there's so much covered there, right? <laughs> and and it's all in areas that we cover, right? From contact center all the way through to uh, uh, to to meetings. Uh, so while I have you know violent agreement for many of of, of those areas, I'm going to try to pick the scraps that are left <laughs> okay. in between. Um, and what, where we focused and where we've seen a lot of uh, the application of AI um, in the last year has been empowering the remote worker. If you look at all of us right now, we're all the same. We're like one single individual in video. There's been this democratization of video, and it's the same for everybody. And I agree about you know the return to office, um, that that will change things. And we can't let that change the experience or disadvantage uh, uh, really anybody. Um, we're really looking for a, a collaboration experience that is completely inclusive and from that point of view and agreeing with what uh, what, what Jonathan uh, said you know I, I also feel that that will be largely down to devices but uh, also AI uh, applications running in the devices like computer vision like being able to frame uh, those uh, remote participants you don't know where the stakeholder is it could be one of the people in the office it could be one of the people still at home it has to be inclusive for everybody so we've been focusing on that a lot and the good good news from our perspective is and a lot of this is largely down to the work that Jonathan referred to from his time here we had a strong vision in this area for a very long time. Um, many of the features we were able to leverage with empowering the remote worker, like background replacements, like um, uh, like doing uh, the um, uh, meeting transcription and uh, being able to catch up on uh, what you missed in a, in a meeting. Um, they've been in place for a long time. Many of these are in place pre-pandemic. They just really came into their own and were accelerated uh, during it. And we feel really good about the uh, return to office environment. Um, you know, that, that is something that is enabled not just by that AI uh, and intelligence overlay, but also through the reach of devices into the, uh, into the office space. So I think across the industry, in every area that everyone here has covered, that there's, you know, there's a, there's a really, really strong reality for AI right now. There's, you know, it's not, certainly not complete, um, but there's an extremely strong future um, as, uh, you know, as we uh, come out of this pandemic. Uh, I think the applications are going to be even stronger than we've seen today. Well, I would have to agree with you. And if there were one technology, one AI technology that is more visible to anybody else, what would you say that is? Well, for me, and the game changer completely was uh, noise removal and speech enhancement with uh, Babel Labs when we added that. Yeah. It's just like, I mean, having, uh, be, being able to just power through a meeting while there's a lawnmower going outside or the kids are playing <laughs> or there's like noise in the background. And, you know, it's a technology that, uh, you know, I've got some, some background in, but at a detection level, when I saw how that technology could evolve towards actually removing the noise without reducing mm -hmm. the quality, in fact, enhancing the quality of the speech. It's truly remarkable stuff. That, that is one, there's been several amazing AI machine learning technologies that really have come to the fore. And I'm sure all, like everybody would, would agree, many of these we might have seen as quirky, cool features a few years ago, and now suddenly we're absolutely business critical. Like you, you don't need something like noise removal maybe so much when you're in an office in a quiet environment when it's all good. Suddenly the world changed, and, and we did, right? And some of these things that were cool innovations suddenly became, uh, you know, mission critical features. So it's one of, of several, but that's, the, yeah, that's certainly the one for me. Well, there's another so, one that I, I would, everybody's looking at. I, I mean, I'm really surprised that nobody on this call does not have this, but you know, this idea of the backgrounds and, and, and the intelligent backgrounds where you can kind of move and have these, have these pretty pictures behind us. Um, that to me, yeah, just like that, that to me seems, and I think Ilya has got, oh, sorry, Ilya, you do have one. Yes, yeah. I was, I, I would was, say this is not actually my living room. Uh, <laughs> I love teams. I don't have a team's poster in my real living room. Oh, come on. I was going to say that too. I would disagree with Keith. I think the noise, uh, politely, of course, that the, the noise <laughs> re removal is cool, but the background replacement came out as a hero. And, and I think yeah. it's because it sent everybody home and many of these people went home. They didn't have an environment that was, you know, like, like I have a nicely curated home office, whatever. I'm, I'm not everybody. A lot of people were working in their bedrooms, their living rooms, their kitchens. And, you know, and, and honestly, it sort of almost felt like an invasion of personal space and the, the background removal allowed people to, you know, have some sense of privacy and comfort working from home. I think it was a very unexpected, in my opinion, sort of hero for, yeah. for this, um, you know, noise suppression is great, but people, I think the, in, in essence, I'd argue, keep the opposite happen. People learn to keep their finger on the mute button. That's a, there's like a cultural shift that people didn't always yes. mute. Now, like 
now you're just an evil human being if you don't have yourself <laughs> muted when you're not speaking. And that honestly has sort of solved like 90% of background, uh, background noise problems. I, I would agree, by the way, with, with both of you, actually. Uh, you know, noise reduction to, to me became more pertinent a little bit later. Once we've been at home for six months, a lot of us got tired of wearing headsets with a boom, myself included. And so that's where machine learning based noise reduction for us in our cloud um, kind of freed many of us uh, to be hands free like I am now and not worry about our kids running into the room or the dogs barking at the Amazon delivery person. Um, but at the same time, the, I was going to uh, agree with you, John, and I think the video segmentation, the machine learning based video segmentation uh, was just huge because not only do these backgrounds help us work in any environment, but it's also a foundational technology. So for us in teams, we use the same technology to do the together mode, which was, you know, a significant change in how people viewed video meetings. And it's something we're going to continue to build on. We think video segmentation is just core to having all sorts of new, more productive layouts and uh, uh, user experiences. Well, let me ask a question. So AI is not perfect. And um, there have been some cases in the press, I haven't read any recently, but but it's not going to be perfect. And there might be some risks associated with using AI technology. So how do you and how do your companies uh, think about handling, handling these risks and the risks of mistakes? And Jonathan, you were, you know, in the contact center, I mean, that's huge because there's a lot of bias that can be introduced in some of these models. And, and if you're creating bots and, and virtual assistants and all these kinds of things that, that you're talking about specifically, uh, how do you handle that, and, and, and what are you going to do? Uh, yeah, I, I call this sort of the, the dirty secret of the AI market, and I think it's still not well understood by sort of the average person who's buying um, tech products. Mm -hmm. That like AI systems have an accuracy. They're all predicting things and guessing mm -hmm. things, and like that accuracy isn't 100% for all, any application and for things like speech recognition and natural language processing, right, which is the backbone of much of it. It's like in the 90, you know, 90% to 95% in the optimistic cases. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it goes way downhill from there. Um, and so you, we see this all the time. Background removal is the same. It's not perfect. In fact, you saw it as Ilya was moving around, like yeah. misses little patches. And so in the case of background removal, it's interesting because the penalty for incorrectness is extremely low. Like in that case, right. so what? A little bit of his shirt got cut off. We saw a little of the back. It doesn't matter, Right. The penalty for inaccuracy goes up just a bit in, say, meetings applications. So if you are having a transcript of the meeting, which we have, 100% that that's going to have wrong things in it. In fact, even if a human transcribed the audio, it would also still have errors in it. Right. It gets worse largely with, um, with the automated systems. Again, sort of not a big deal, but then you step it up. Like, hey, Keith, you know, if you have a system that's taking notes, like I give us an action item, and the system, and people get used to not writing down the action items because the assistant in the meeting captures them. Now, all of a sudden, it starts to be a bigger deal if it gets it wrong or misses it or assigns it to the wrong person. These are actually impacting businesses. In the Connex Center, you know, the, the penalties go even up if you're not careful. And the solution, by the way, is you have to factor this into the design of your product. So I'll give you a story on how we approach this for Agent Assist. So we shipped Agent Assist. That's a web application that sits next on the agent's desktop while they're speaking to a customer. So it's still a human to human conversation. Um, like the WebEx assistant Keith was talking about, it's listening in on the meeting and it's taking notes and taking actions on behalf of the agent. And one of the things we did is we were having it summarize the calls. It makes mistakes all the time. Like, I mean, super hard to do this correctly. Rec and, and at the end of the call, everyone wants this in the, in the CRM database is like a record of the call. So this is like a database of record for the experience of a customer. And what happened is really important to be accurate. So we added a feature to the product where the agent during and at the end of the call could just make a couple clicks, remove the things that were wrong, add the things that were missing, and we did all kinds of stuff to make it fast. So we, we accommodate the inaccuracy in the AI by augmenting it with the human correction before we get it in the CRM. And, and we get in the end, we get like a net net time saving still with a much, much higher degree of accuracy. And that literally impacted the design of the product. And so that's my lesson is like, you have to design your product understanding the cost, the penalty of AI inaccuracy, 
what happens if it's wrong and what does the product do for you to help you deal with it? Maybe it doesn't matter if it's inaccurate. Maybe it does. You've got to understand that. Okay. How, how would uh, you, Keith and Ilya, how would you uh, uh, address this? Yeah, well, that's that's something uh, obviously that we saw, uh, you know, a, a lot of in some of the early speech and natural language adoption. And I completely agree with uh, with, with Jonathan's view in in uh, meeting transcription, for example, having you know a, a user correct something. You weight that pretty highly compared to other ways you might score or adjust the algorithm or, or guide the algorithm behind it uh, because the user has taken an action that in itself has a you know has a, a high uh, weighting. Um, but you, you talked you, you, the original question was really about say the areas that may be you know scary in that space and and um i think the the key area and where this gets to overall is is data privacy right so that's that's something that um uh, that that ai is fed by data um and it's you know that's something that for it to be accurate and for um uh, enterprises to adopt it there's that that fine balance between um how much can we train the systems on ourselves with our data uh, versus needing to go into the the customer domain uh, we've taken a pretty conservative approach towards that in in favor of the, the customer. We've also taken a fairly conservative approach in terms of where we deploy uh, some of the machine learning models uh, to try avoid uh, issues like that when it comes to things like face recognition or uh, Ilya mentioned the, the noise removal in the cloud. We don't do it in the cloud. We don't do it there for two reasons. One, the noise happens at the microphone, not at the cloud. Um, and also that uh, it, um, you know, we have customers that don't like the idea of a process that is in intercepting the uh, audio or city in on it in, in some way of course when it comes to transcription it's a, like a, ne a necessary uh, thing although it's you know client side speech models are becoming more um, uh, you know more uh, um, achievable as, as well so it's I, I suppose overall um, you, the the attitude towards uh, data privacy and uh, that's one of the areas that kind of uh, data privacy itself is an area that scares me in general right so our attitude towards it and I think the industry attitude has got to be um, the the right type of data privacy policy for each of the different problem domains there's certainly no one size fits all to that uh, we've got to adjust as we go and as things move also away from um, the more most of the solutions we're talking about are supervised learning uh, based as we move towards unsupervised and semi-supervised we have to be prepared to move into that customer data domain and there will be a whole new range of policies and areas that we'll need to work with customers on there's not a lot i think already defined in in that space um, so those are those are the areas that that sort of jump out to me um, as the sort of the potential for scariness, let's say, but, uh, but I think we've been able to address those um, very well by taking a somewhat conservative approach, but in the interests of, of data privacy. Thank you. Ilya, what are you, what are you thinking about? Sure. I should clarify. Well, first of all, violent agreement with everything John Keith said, <laughs> just to keep the, the pattern going. Um, I should clarify, by the way, for us, the, Machine learning based noise cancellation happens locally at the team's client. The machine learning for it happens in the cloud. I would suspect the same thing is true for uh, for most of our, our friends and competitors as well. Um, having worked in speech recognition for a long time, the big game changer was the ability to do machine learning at cloud scale. Uh, um, that really just dramatically improved um, uh, the the quality. Uh, in terms of concerns, I think sort of working backwards from what Keith said, certainly for us at Microsoft, compliance overall, privacy, uh, data management, that's job one. Uh, with Office 365 now, Microsoft 365, you know, we're a platform that hundreds of millions of users and, and companies count on. And uh, being a reliable platform in terms of something that users can rely on with full confidence, that's that's top of mind. So anything we do always errs on the side of privacy, compliance, um, and security. On top of that, though, we, we have to think about how to combine that with what Jonathan said, which is what are the tools that we can give users that make the AI-based capabilities better, and how do we make those tools really easy to get to, and what's the value of users providing us a little bit more information in a compliant way that then makes AI better? So for example, when we're talking about 
taking notes and action items and so forth. One of, and transcription. One of the things that makes all of that better is if we can identify individual people. If we could say, you know, Brent said, uh, hey, Ilya, Jonathan, Keith, welcome. And then Ilya said, great to be here. Makes the whole transcript more readable. It's pretty straightforward right now when we're all remote because we all have our own mic. But when there's multiple people in a room together, it gets more interesting. One of the things that can help with that is enrolling a biometric footprint. You know, having me or Jonathan or Keith say, okay, I will record some, you know, short sentence and I'm okay with that being used in the cloud as long as I can delete it. It goes away if I ever change companies. Low risk for me having been at Microsoft 26 and a half years, but still, um, you know, I have full control over that and I see value to me in making me more productive. So, so that's our mindset. It's let me as a user know that I can very easily and quickly take these actions uh, in a transcript, tag myself as a speaker, and use that piece as my uh, biometric footprint. Um, very easily take actions with full confidence. Uh, that combination, we think, is sort of the right balance uh, in terms of making AI better while keeping users really confident. Thank you. You know, there's been some terms that have been mentioned on the call, like uh, supervised learning and semi-supervised learning and, and, and so forth. And, and it's kind of bringing to mind a question, and that is, it seems like each AI tool is very specific. There's a tool for, say, uh, you know, for doing the transcription. There's a tool for image recognition. There's, you know, related tools for, for doing the backgrounds and, you know, a, a number of different tools. But it seems like each one of these has to have its own big data set. It has to, it, they're all really separate. And then, you know, as you build the products, they've, they've got to be, you know, invoked at the right times and so forth. Is there any thinking within, you know, what are you thinking about with respect to um, the idea of, of being able to have common data sets or solutions that aren't so hard to build and make and, and, and so forth? Are we getting any closer to democratizing AI other than just you making the products and we using them, something like that? Any thoughts or comments on this whole idea of, of building products and solutions? Yeah, it's um, I mean, that's a great question, uh, and it's something yeah I'm sure everybody across the industry is 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 grappling with. I won't say struggling with, we're, everybody's kind of thriving in the area, <laughs> but it's you're grappling with it, trying to make that yeah. as efficient as possible mm -hmm. with this you know new new way of uh, of building software. Um, the you know the data sets is one part of it, um, and you're right in that many of these uh, uh, features that well are yeah the functionality may, might manifest itself in a certain feature, but you can categorize these as well. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier with uh, talking about you know computer vision so in computer vision there's a certain number of, of uh, features and you can um, you know you, you can develop efficiently in that space like we recently launched uh, uh, gesture recognition right so that if I like if I give a thumbs up right. you'll see the thumbs up emoji fly yeah. across the screen as a reaction mm -hmm. um, but you know the, the approach for something like that is is uh, similar to what you might do for the segmentation that we talked about earlier so you can get a reuse out of some of your data sets solving for the problem that Jonathan called out of when you move your hands around and, and the arms get cut off, that clearly shouldn't happen, but those are gestures too. So you can get a reuse in some of those, but they're relatively small gains uh, though, you know, to, to your, to the bigger question, but there are efficiencies uh, like that, that, um, you know, that, that, uh, I think we've all identified uh, across uh, across the industry, and then it, it also is necessary, you know, in, in the way you asked the question of um, you know categorizing each of these separately. Sometimes it's just necessary to solve in a specific area because it's either where the problem occurs or where you want the the, the solution to be. Like the the reference I made made uh, earlier with that that noise removal, like it it is mm -hmm. local. It's a neural network right. running locally on the client. Right. So so you've um, you know it's it, and it requires a lot of special effort to make that happen and for it to run um, uh, efficiently there. So I, we may not get away from some of those so quickly because they're maybe so valuable in that space. But uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. And I think there will be a big uh, shift towards the, the uh, I'll call them less supervised techniques to, to, <laughs> to make it inclusive, but I think we'll see a shift towards those. Yeah, and this is an area sort of, of active research too. I think it's been pretty fascinating. Like if you look at natural language processing, um, some super recent innovations in 
sort of models that can um, perform general purpose tasks and you just give it as an example of what you want, you know, and it, and it gives you answers from there. So the GPT-3 uh, NLP project is the one I'm specifically referring to um, is a great example of, you know, where I think a bunch of the industry is headed, which is um, in cases where like a, it's like sort of generalized understanding of, a, of something um, where, you know, giving a few examples is sufficient for an average, you know, person to mm -hmm. give an answer, the AI will be able to do some more things. So I think we're seeing great innovation there. And this is and in an image processing. There's similar uh, advancements where people using pre-trained models where you start with something that sort of right. generally understands an image. And then when you want to train it for the things you're particularly looking for, you need much less training data um, because, you know, it sort of is mostly there. Right. Um, and NLP, that's sort of where much of NLP is today. Um, so I think we're seeing innovation in that direction. We're seeing innovation in tooling that makes it easier uh, to create what it, whatever labeling we needs to still be done for supervision. So assisted mm -hmm. labeling, uh, which is a semi-supervised thing, is really big. Uh, I know we're spending time on that. Uh, the last thing I'll say, though, is like at the end of the day, an AI will still never be able to do things that require business expertise unique to a company, right? So as an example of like, you know, summarizing a call in a contact center, like generic text summarization, even done by human, will only go so far because you require training and understanding of what's important to the business. Right. So I think that'll never go away there. If there's something you need to a business that's important to them, you know, that'll have to be set up, but the complexity of setting that up uh, to tune and customize it for their needs is, is diminishing over time. So it's actually a really exciting time to be working in this space. Awesome. Thank you. Well, let me shift gears just a little bit. Um, take just a second and, and respond to this question. So there's been some, some discussion back and forth about where the AI, AI processing should happen. For example, Cisco has processing that's uh, in the devices itself. All right, at least for many of them, you've got the NVIDIA chips that do the matrix uh, manipulation really quick. Uh, Jonathan, you're all, everything you do is up in the cloud, and so that's not an option for you. And Ilya, you're kind of in between. I think some partners of yours have some, some AI that's done, say, in the camera head, maybe the Hudley camera and some other things. Uh, but I'm not seeing a, a lot of yours done necessarily on a, on a client, and, and maybe, maybe that will happen in the future. But where should this happen? Is the right place on the, on the devices, R right here locally? Is it in the cloud? It, does it just depend on the problem? How, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll, I'll start uh, if okay. I can. Uh, I think the short answer is everywhere. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I know that's trite, but that, that is how we're looking at it. Um, there are a lot of benefits to running ML code on the edge, uh, let's call it the peripheral, the camera, the audio device in, in my scenario, okay. on the client. Uh, so that's where we run noise cancellation and segmentation today. And in some cases in the cloud, uh, where you both learn from the other two, from the edge and the client. And there are some you know, transcription, as, as Keith said earlier, some ML-based, AI-based processes that just make sense to use the cloud power. So for us, you can see this today uh, on the Surface Pro X, where uh, we have an actual AI SOC built in, custom for us. We do eye gaze correction and video. Oh, that's right. Specifically on that device. Mm -hmm. As you said, some of our partners, like I happen to be using a, a Poly, uh, one of their new P15s right now. They have their own AI code and we benefit from it, which is how I'm getting framed, I think, nicely uh, by the camera. And it follows me as I move around. Uh, and then, as I, as I said, there's a lot of our own AI. Now, some of what we do in the cloud today, I think in the future, will move more towards the edge. Um, so segmentation, for example, uh, which happens today in the cloud, and again, learn, or sorry, locally and learning in the cloud, I think some of that could move to the very edge device over time as well. Excellent. 
other thoughts? We've kind of talked about this a little bit, but any, yeah. Keith? Well, I, I think you, you um, the, the answer was kind of in the question, which is it depends on the problem. It really does. Uh, you know, it's it, it, we, we've tried to take the approach of applying the best techniques um, in the most appropriate areas uh, heavily influenced by data privacy. Um, so we listened a lot to customers about where they would like uh, to see some of these features implemented and available to them. And also where was like out of bounds? Where were they not comfortable and why not? And on to understand that and we drove a lot of early uh, AI data privacy policies uh, with enterprise customers ba based on their feedback. So ultimately it became um, about you know uh, applying um, the right technique in the appropriate area whether that is device, the soft client, uh, cloud, uh, whichever it might be. And then there's also just certain functionality that um, as, as Ailey mentioned you, you know you, it, either economically or just in terms of compute power, it just makes sense to be in a certain area. You just, you know, you can only do one in one area or, or another. And then in like in the contact center space, it, it's been, you know, there's there's a slightly different attitude, I think, towards, uh, uh, towards uh, data and integrations in that many are really, you know, truly required. In a lot of enterprise, uh, maybe knowledge worker environments, it's, it's a bit more like walled garden type approach. Um, but in the contact center space, there's integrations to lots of different uh, systems uh, uh, so that there's there's a little more flexibility. That doesn't mean that data privacy is any less important, of course, but uh, it, it offers for more flexibility, I think, in that space. That's what we've, we've found, at least. Let me ask Jonathan. I think if, yeah, if, you, if you look at speech oh. reco, just let me add to that, too, is right. an interesting case. I, I think we're seeing generally you push it as close to the edge as you can. Um, it used to be you couldn't do it on a PC or a mobile phone, and I think right. the, because of the compute power wasn't there, but that's changing. Right. And I think we're seeing, you know, GPUs and TPUs soon getting deployed into PCs and devices, and that'll just make the economics of of this way better when you can. Um, in addition to the, 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 the data privacy benefits that Keith and, and Ilya have already talked about, um, Connect Center is a little different because of the huge PSDN focus. And sort of when, whenever you're dealing with speech recognition, the PSDN, you inevitably end up needing to do it in the cloud because that's that's your edge. Your edge, your device, your ingress device is the PSDN gateway or something just on the other side of it. So Connect Center, which tends to favor PSDN, you know, generally is doing transcription in the cloud out of necessity. Um, meetings products, which are shifting to have less and less PSDN participants, we're seeing a, a corresponding shift in my view, and we'll, we'll continue pushing that stuff towards the clients for cost effectiveness and data privacy. So, Jonathan, a couple of years ago, I had about 25 seconds with you at Enterprise Connect. You're a very busy man there. But one thing you said to me is still, is still resonating in my mind, and that is AI is going to transform the contact center. Yep. Could you just take 60 seconds and tell us what that means? Yep. Why is that going to happen? What does that mean? Yeah. So I, I think what it means is sort of what I was saying in the, in the beginning of the call is that Connect Center is an area where every minute matters for the agents, for the Connect Center, for the customer. And there's and it's an area of business that's been very heavily dominated by people doing repetitive manual tasks, actually. So uh, those two factors combined together is just a recipe for AI touching everything. So literally, there's no part of a Connect Center that you can point at and say AI isn't going to change it. So it's going to change the agent experience where, you know, we're working towards agent assistance, helping, um, you know, summarize calls, give suggestions, coach, take notes, perform automations on behalf of the agent, um, you know, filling out forms for them, lots of stuff that can happen to make the agent's job faster. It's going to provide a better experience for the end user who dials in via much more natural self-service uh, which is what, what everybody really wants these days is, you know, have a quick conversation, get the answer. And, 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 they, and to a large degree, I view um, she who I cannot speak her name, who is the Amazon lady, um, <laughs> you know, that everyone has in their house now. When you say, hey, blah, you ask a quick question, you get a quick yeah. answer. Yeah. I think if that experience, people love it, right? If you could get that for your Connex Center too, that kind of experience where you connect in and says, how can I help you today? It says, well, I want to know what's, you know, what's the current balance on my checking and, you know, when is, when am I going to get my interest payment? And it just gives you the uh -huh. answer, right? That's uh -huh. what people want. So it's going to change that. It's going to change how we do routing of calls. It's going to change how we manage workforce and how many agents do you need in a given shift. And it's going to change how we think about quality and understanding whether agents are doing a good job, literally like everything. 
Outstanding. So you kind of put on your futurist hat there just a little bit, and we're going to see a lot of changes there in the contact center. Keith, I'd like to give you and then then Ilya a chance to, to kind of put on your futurist hat and say, where is this going from your perspective and what you're seeing both personally and within your, your companies? Keith, you start. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's and it's, it, for, first of all, where I see you going is, uh, I'm going to use the word Jonathan said earlier, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be in the AI space, and it, specifically AI in the collaboration space. There's there's so much opportunity to make a difference with the technology, to solve problems that, you know, weren't solvable before. And that's uh, uh, that's that's really the, the, the starting point. In terms of where it will go, um, you know, I, I think we're going to see in the short term a lot of uh, combinations of existing technologies, right? So, we talked earlier about things like uh, face recognition. Jonathan just talked about it, about the experience of, you know, being able to call and check an account. The, the, the problem is not the speech interaction. The problem there is like, I don't want somebody else doing that on my account. It's identity and it's security <laughs> and it's biometrics and, you yeah. know, getting that done. We actually have the tech to make the UX for that easy. Um, it's uh, the enforcement of the of, of all of the things that matter uh, that are going to make the difference. Uh, and that's, that's the same if it comes to starting a meeting. Um, we did some experimentation with something called a proactive mode, right? So when I walk into a meeting room using ultrasound proximity and face recognition determined that it's me, so now it's okay to start the meeting. So like, post-COVID in terms of immediate future, that's huge, right? So we've, the whole industry has talked about zero touch experiences for a long time or, you know, one, maybe one button to push to join a meeting, but what about just totally zero touch? Right. So I think, you know, heavy focus on speech interfaces, on uh, cognitive recognition scenarios so that you can just work through your working day while we're very proud of the beautiful panes of glass that we have in the device portfolio, it won't be even better if you don't have to touch them at all. Um, so that's a very immediate uh, future for focus. I think looking much, uh, you know, much further out, although based on existing realities, I'm very hopeful for a lot of the underlying data structures, in particular graph data structures, uh, to feed some of the intelligent uh, experiences that, uh, that, you know, that we'll see, whether that's in the remote worker or the, the hybrid uh, office uh, scenario. And, and then finally, in, in uh, I think Jonathan alluded to this right at the beginning of the call in terms of return to office, the scope for device innovation in the workplace um, is, I think, now going to be huge. People will realize even more the value of devices collaborating from anywhere, using different types of spaces to collaborate uh, uh, from. If you think about a, a year ago, the buzzword was huddle rooms. Yeah. And then a pandemic yeah. happened, and the sheer thought of huddle is like <laughs> horrifying, yeah. right? So, it's, <laughs> but what, where is that going to go next? Where is it, you know, where will that use of office space um, and, and efficient use of office space with those inclusive uh, scenarios that we talked about early earlier uh, happen? And how will we enable those? So the scope is just is is huge, um, and the and the potential to apply AI and machine learning for intelligent experiences is is pretty exciting. I think across the whole industry. Thank you. Ilya, what are your thoughts? Um, yet again, I, I find myself agreeing with uh, a lot of what was said. It, it is an incredibly exciting area. Um, I think uh, it's exciting. It's fun. It's also uh, an area where we feel a ton of accountability and responsibility to our customers in terms of how Teams is, how customers do work in, in many ways. So from an AI perspective, uh, in the short term and long term, we think AI will enhance every part of collaboration and communication, whether it's voice commanding so that we can be touch free, as Keith said, uh, AI that works on my behalf to pull out quick responses, action notes, as we've talked about, suggested meeting times. Um, or uh, audio and video AI that helps me be my best self where the home office is the new huddle, uh, to Keith's point, um, but also helps all of us in a meeting feel productive when some are eventually, hopefully soon, in a meeting room and some are across the world. So, again, every aspect is going to get touched by AI. It is being touched by AI. To your earlier point, Brent, I think AI is democratized or being democratized right now. Uh, looking out a little bit more, I think AI will enable us to, frankly, have less meetings, uh, get rid of the, the FOMO term, the fear of missing out, uh, yeah. because I can actually have a better meeting after the fact 
quickly watching the recording, having the key pieces pointed out to me. Um, and I also think AI will just transform our expectations of online meetings. Uh, what we did with Together Mode, that's just the beginning of how we can go from a grid to a, a much more enveloping experience. Well, thank you. Uh, we have had a, a really good 45 minutes together. And for those who have listened, there are so many exciting and, and fantastic technologies that are coming down the road. We have many of them, them that have been delivered today. You're seeing that in the contact center that Jonathan Rosenberg in, and his team is helping to develop. And we're seeing that in the communications and collaboration solutions that Keith and Ilya and Cisco and Microsoft uh, have before us. It's a very bright future for AI. We look forward to that. And may I say to each of the panelists, Ilya and Keith and Jonathan, thank you for being with us today, and we'll look forward to seeing all of you at the next Enterprise Connect event that's live. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Okay.